Good morning and welcome to the Virtual Harmful Algal Bloom Research Symposium. Uh, I'm Dan Devlin. I'm the director of the Kansas Water Resources Institute at Kansas State University, and I have the privilege to be the moderator for the session this morning. I want to first thank the, all of you for taking time out of your schedule to get online for the symposium. It's obviously an important issue. Uh, in my state, it goes from uh, farm ponds and livestock drinking concerns all the way through recreation and drinking water. Uh, we have over a thousand individuals that are registered for this symposium. Uh, the uh, symposium is hosted by the Algal Bloom Action Team, of which I am a member. The Algal Bloom Action Team is a is a collaboration of water professionals, researchers, and educators from the, North, from the 12 states in the North Central region of the United States. Team members include the net, individuals from the net, National Network of Water Resources Research Institutions, Institutes, which are in each state, one in each state, the North Central Region Water Network, and also individuals from University Extension within each state in the North Central Region. Uh, this morning is the first session of the symposium and we'll focus on monitoring and identifying harmful algal blooms. We'll have a uh, we'll have another session research session uh, this afternoon and then one, another one in the morning and then we'll finish up with another research session tomorrow afternoon. The session this morning will last two hours and feature three presentations from leading researchers across the north central region. Uh, we will uh, have a, each, the, each speaker this morning will speak from 20 to 25 minutes, and then we'll have questions after that. Uh, we'll also have a 10 minute break this morning, uh, starting at 9.45, uh, again, 10 minutes, and then we'll start again at 9.55 for a second presentation. Following this morning's presentations, we will host a one hour facilitated discussion on how to, on how to better facilitate the work of the Algal Bloom team. The, uh, our team is working to develop a website of resources, including fact sheets and questions and answers on HABs topics. Additionally, we are, we are planning a series of webinars. We hope to get the first one started on in February with various researchers across the North Central region. We're also recording video content on research projects and we hope to continue to host this symposium in the future. Hopefully next time it can be live and also virtual uh, both. Uh, however, to, to do these things, we are seeking your input during the symposium on how we can improve the dissemination of materials and content areas of research for the public. Due to the number of people at symposium and platform constraints, an additional sign up was required for the facilitated discussion. Uh, if you have any questions about the facilitated discussion and how to sign up for those that have, still have space and some of the later, the first one's filled I believe, uh, but the later ones there may still be some room on those. Uh, or if you're having any technical issues during our, our meeting today and tomorrow, please note that in our chat room and, and one of us will do our best to try to assist you and, and help you do that. Uh, again, if you have questions, and again, we'll be doing questions following each presentation, please place those in the question and answer, answer panel, and I'll ask them to the presenters today as time allows. Before we get started, I want to thank our symposium, our symposium sponsors. Uh, in addition to the support of the North Central Region Water Network and the National Network of Water Resource Institutes. We also so want to thank our champion sponsors, FlowCam and Linnotech, and our partner sponsor, uh, uh, Euroflex. Okay, let's get started. This morning's topic is monitoring and identifying harmful algal blooms. And we have these three speakers uh, lined up for today. Our first speaker, that I'm delighted to introduce is Dr. Grace Wilkinson. She recently started a position as assistant professor at the Center for Limnology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Previously, she was an assistant professor at Iowa State University, 
Her research focuses on links between lakes and the landscape, mediated through the flow of organic matter and nutrients, and the resulting consequences of these linkages on ecosystem resilience and function. She uses a combination of whole ecosystem experiments, comparative surveys, and high-frequency observations to investigate patterns and drivers of aquatic ecosystem dynamics. So again, I, uh, her topic this morning that she's going to speak to us on is the understanding algal bloom trajectories in the context of global change. So Grace, I wanna welcome you again, and I'll see if I can figure out how to move this, how to stop sharing my screen and move it over to you. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll get this fired up here. Fantastic. Wonderful. Well, first of all, thank you so much to the um, organizers for putting together this fantastic symposium and inviting me to share my research. And thank you also to you all for being here this morning, especially if your New Year's resolution was to spend less time on Zoom. I appreciate you spending some time here with us this morning. Um, I'm going to be sharing some new research that's been coming out of my lab that I've been working on for the past year um, that's about understanding algal bloom trajectories in the context of global change. And so it seems that everywhere that we look these days, we're seeing uh, more and more news stories about harmful algal blooms in our lakes and in our communities and the very negative effects that they're having on our communities because of the loss of ecosystem services. Algal blooms or the rapid proliferation of algal biomass that can reach nuisance or even harmful levels. Um, can uh, negatively affect ecosystem services. They diminish them. Um, these can be services such as loss of the water supply because of cyanotoxins or taste and odor, odor compounds that are being produced, loss of food supply through fish kills or cyanotoxins, a loss of recreational value of that ecosystem because of beach closures or it's not safe to recreate in that ecosystem because of the bloom, as well as just a loss of perceived value of that ecosystem for recreation due to um, the, uh, excuse me, due to um, the constant harmful algal blooms. We also see a loss of biodiversity that can uh, accompany harmful algal blooms. This can be because of fish kills and food web collapse. And we see a loss of property value, um, which of course decreases the tax base that can address some of these water quality problems. And there's just overall an economic loss due to harmful algal blooms that in the United States is estimated to be somewhere on the order of billions of dollars every year. And so given the consequences of harmful algal blooms, we would like to be able to prevent them from happening, um, predict them and in their magnitude and be able to mitigate their severity. However, it's often not easily accomplished. And this is because the drivers that lead to a sustained harmful algal bloom are both complex and interacting. So of course, nutrient availability is an important driver, and these can be nutrients that are originating in the watershed, um, particularly phosphorus and nitrogen that are coming into the ecosystem, either through overland flow or even subsurface and groundwater flow. And we actually have a recent paper that's coming out in environmental science and technology that reviews perhaps the importance of groundwater loading and how we might be overlooking that in terms of harmful algal blooms. But it's just not, not just the total nutrient load, right? It's the um, timing of that external nutrient load. So when it's coming in relation to how algae can use it, it's the magnitude. So how much is coming in, the form of those nutrients, whether it's in a dissolved inorganic form like nitrate um, that may be more directly usable or if it's in, bound up in organic matter and the stoichiometric ratio of those nutrients and what's available, um, what's coming in the supply availability in relation to what um, the algae themselves need and what's available. Internal loading um, is also uh, one of the potential drivers and a source of nutrients and it's a complex Compos uh, complex uh, process that can be from physical resuspension of sediments, which can release phosphorus, chemical sorption, as well as biologically mediated processes that can release phosphorus and recycle it in ecosystems. And there's a seasonality to this internal loading, right? And we also know that it's spatially complex. It, there can be hot spots and hot moments of this internal loading, and it's very much affected by stratification in the water body. So very complex processes there. 
Um, of course, there's also uh, the residence time of these nutrients in the water column and what, um, how long they're available for algae to potentially take up and use to fuel a harmful algal bloom. And algal biomass, as well as the community composition, is being regulated also not just from the bottom up by nutrients, but top down control by grazers, such as the daphnia that's pictured here. And of course, there's also light availability as a resource that fuels that bloom and the ability to compete for light in the water column. And uh, temperature, right? So cyanobacteria thrive in warmer waters, or that's generally the case, but temperature also relates to stratification and the stability of that water column um, and the organisms, particularly cyanobacteria, that might be able to thrive or outcompete in more stable conditions. There's also, of course, how close that eco particular ecosystem is to various critical thresholds or the resilience of that system um, and is important. So for example, in shallow lakes, um, if there are mechanisms in place um, such as having macrophyte dominance that would lead to um, the ecosystem being able to take on more and more of um, those external or absorb those shocks from external nutrient loading will um, mitigate and change how those um, that nutrient availability uh, changes harmful algal blooms in the water. And so it's for these reasons, um, there are many drivers, they're all interacting, and the resources are not uniformly available in space and time. And so it's for these reasons that enacting effective management for harmful algal blooms is really difficult. Um, and these human activities in particular are causing large scale changes to these drivers, which makes management even more difficult. So we know that changes in land use are driving changes in external loading. So globally, we've seen an expansion as well as intensification of agriculture. And here in the United States, particularly in this upper Midwestern region, we can see there's large amounts of fertilizer applied to the landscape, um, both in the form of nitrogen and phosphorus, as you can see from these figures here. That is creating a very nutrient-rich watershed um, that can be contributing to external loading. At the same time, populations are increasing and the difference in density between urban and rural areas continues to grow. This is placing a larger burden on water resources as well as sewage treatment in re some regions more than others. And that can uh, really come to a head when it comes to harmful algal blooms. And even the way in which we're using our inland waters is changing, right? So as marine capture fisheries have been plateauing in their rates over the past number of decades, we're seeing an increase in freshwater aquaculture and inland aquaculture facilities. And so all of these human driven changes have very real consequences for surface waters as eutrophication has become widespread. So using uh, EPA national lake and stream assessment data, Stoddard and colleagues um, found that only 1.6% of streams and 6.7% of lakes um, had total phosphorus concentrations that were less than 10 micrograms per liter. In other words, there's been this loss of oligotrophic systems across the continent, so at this continental scale. And it would be reasonable for us to think that this widespread eutrophication could be fueling more severe algal blooms in lakes. But it's not just nutrient availability that's changing. We're seeing increasing surface temperatures in lakes. Um, so this is rapid warming. We're seeing rapid warming of um, sur summertime surface temperatures in lakes, although there can be quite variable warming. It's not specific, certainly not every lake. But this increase in surface temperature, of course, could be favoring cyanobacteria, uh, allowing for more um, dominance of that, those um, different taxa modifying stratification and the stability of that water column. And even in some high latitude lakes, it's changing ice cover duration, which could be modifying both the biogeochemical processes that are happening in winter that can be important for the following summer, as well as just the amount of time that are and light availability and the amount of time uh, for the growing season. Precipitation patterns are also changing, right? Particularly the number of um, extreme events that we're seeing. And so we've seen uh, both an increase in precipitation, about a 10 to 15% here in the Midwest over the past number of decades, but most importantly, the number of extreme events or really large heavy precipitation events continues to increase, particularly in the past decades. And this is certainly changing the timing and magnitude and form of external nutrient loading. And so consequently, it's been hypothesized that the interaction of accelerated eutrophication 
coincident with climate change has led to widespread intensification of algal, to, algal blooms in lakes, particularly in their magnitude and severity. Again, because we see these drivers, these global scale drivers, widespread eutrophication, as well as climate change that could be affecting how algal blooms are forming and fueled and um, their severity in lakes and reservoirs across the globe, we would expect based on this hypothesis that we're seeing ex um, a large spread scale intensification. And coincident with this algal bloom intensification hypothesis has been increased media attention and growing public awareness of algal blooms. So for example, you can see here the uh, number of local media reports of algal blooms has been growing over the past decade. So this match of scientific anticipation and public attention is creating the perception that broadly speaking, blooms are intensifying in inland waters. But we actually haven't really confronted this hypothesis with a lot of data. And so it's unclear if algal blooms are in fact getting worse. And so it's this simple question here, are algal blooms getting worse that I hope to address and answer today. And it's what I've been working on with collaborators, particularly from the University of Virginia over the past number of months. So first, in order to answer this question, we need to define what bloom intensification actually means. We need to create some metrics. And so we propose three metrics for algal bloom um, intensification. This is an increase in bloom magnitude, severity, and duration. So first, an increase in bloom magnitude, we're defining as an increase in the mean summertime chlorophyll A, right? Because chlorophyll A we can use as a proxy, um, albeit an imperfect one, but for algal biomass. And an increase in bloom magnitude coincides with an increasing likelihood that ecosystem services might be lost from that ecosystem. Um, an increase in bloom severity, we're defining as an increase in the 95th percentile of chlorophyll A during the summer. So in other words, the peak of the bloom, how severe that bloom is getting. And uh, so this would look like if a lake was um, normally looked like A during the summer and it peaked looking like Lake B that you see there on the side of the slide, an increase in severity means that it goes from looking like B at its worst to starting to look like C at its worst, right? So an increase in that severity. And this is somewhat associated with a higher likelihood of severe consequences from harmful algal blooms, things like fish kills. And then finally, we have an increase in the duration. And this is an increasing number of observations above a certain chlorophyll A threshold. And that threshold was defined as 11 micrograms per liter, which came from a wonderful analysis by Ungradi and colleagues uh, that looked at the National Lake Assessment data and where there was a loss of recreational value and what chlorophyll A concentration was associated with that loss of recreational value. And so that's where that threshold comes from. And duration is associated with an increasing periods of summertime economic loss. So the longer your lake looks like, say, Lake B or C, the more time people are going to say, eh, that's not a lake I want to go recreate on or go spend my time and money to travel to. And so next, we needed to find data that allowed us to evaluate these different metrics. And so um, first, we need, needed to have data series or time series that were long enough um, in order to capture an actual trend in these bloom metrics. So we limit our analyses to time series of at least 10 years, um, where there were summertime chlorophyll A measurements for at least 10 years, with only one year gap within those 10 years. So we were looking at these decadal time series because we wanted to look at long term trends in blue met metrics, not just short term spurious trends. Additionally, we needed um, to make sure that we could capture these blue metrics adequately. And so what we did is we found 31 lake years of daily chlorophyll A measurements. And these were from lakes that were oligotrophic and rarely experienced blooms to those that were hypereutrophic and experienced blooms a lot and very frequently. And so we took those 31 lake years and we did a rarefaction analysis. And um, from this analysis, we determined that a 14-day sampling interval, so in other words, the lake being measured, chlorophyll A being measured at least every two weeks during the summer, was adequate to capture these bloom metrics um, while still allowing us to analyze a large number of lakes. And so based on these data requirements, we gathered chlorophyll A time series mainly using the Lagos database. So the Lagos database or the Lake Multiscale Geospatial and Temporal Database is a freely available um, database that includes um, tens of thousands of lakes that are um, strewn across 17 states shown in this figure here. Um, in the map that you're seeing. 
uh, that are um, measurements, whether it's a single measurement or measurements over time. And so we looked for lakes in the database that had at least 10 years of measurements with less than one year missing. And there were measurements every 14 days during the summer. Now, Lagos only goes up through 2013, and so we supplemented some of these lakes with data, um, largely from state agencies' websites, uh, to bring them more up to the present day to 2019, so we had even longer time series. And we also relied on some of our um, own networks and uh, data or monitoring, the, uh, monitoring networks that have been done, such as the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers monitoring in Iowa and the North Temperate Lakes LTER site. So in total, we identified 323 lakes with data sets that spanned at least 10 years and measurements of chlorophyll A every 14 days during the summer. And in order to um, look at these different bloom metrics and whether or not there were trends in them, the trend analysis was for increasing or decreasing magnitude, severity, and duration, as I previously described. And to do this, we did a generalized least squares linear regression. And uh, if you're interested, the model error was a first order autoregressive correlation structure to control for temporal autocorrelation. Now, we didn't just look for increasing or decreasing. We also tested if these 323 lakes time series were better fit by a quadratic function, which might indicate that the lake had deteriorated but then improved or vice versa. Um, but none of our lakes met this criteria or were better fit by the quadratic function. And so we used the um, least squares regression. So what did we find? Well, among the 323 lakes, there was a lot of variability in the three different bloom metrics. But one thing is really clear. There's no widespread intensification of algal blooms. Only 11% of the lakes in this, out of these 323 lakes were getting significantly worse in at least one of the metrics, whether it was magnitude, severity, or duration. Surprisingly, however, 17% of the lakes were actually getting better. In other words, they were improving in one or more of those metrics. And in fact, of the 17 lakes that were 17% of lakes that were getting better, um, two thirds of the lakes had at least two of the metrics that were improving, if not all three. So a lot of evidence for improving. And so. Um, the large number of lakes that were improving was really surprising to us, and it runs contrary to that algal intensification hypothesis that I had told you about. So we tried to investigate why so many lakes are getting better. So first, it's possible that the lakes that we studied are by no means randomly selected, right? Um, they were being measured frequently, at least every two weeks for over a decade, which probably means that those lakes are pretty important in terms of a public good, and they might be subjected to more management or more restoration or have more public dollars flowing to them. And so that could really bias our sample, right? Well, um, there have been some recent studies and corrobor um, corroborating studies that have found in a non-biased non sample, so a very random sample of 14,000 lakes in the United States, that water clarity is in fact improving on average overall. And so this was some work done by Simon Topp and colleagues, and it's available as a preprint on Earth Archive. I'd encourage you to go take a look at this great study. Um, and what they found in their non-random sampling, or in their random sampling, excuse me, of 14,000 US lakes is that water clarity is also increasing. And water clarity would of course be affected by algal biomass as well. And so that certainly corroborates, as well as some other work done by Sam Oliver earlier looking at these, this similar Lagos database. So um, it's certainly possible that there is some bias within our data set, but we are seeing, um, based on other corroborating studies, that these um, trends that we're seeing might actually be true. So, so why are so many lakes getting better? Well, we hypothesize that it might be due to um, the Clean Water Act and other water quality policy that's been implemented over the past number of decades. And we're capturing that a subset of these lakes are actually being substantially, are substantially benefiting in their water quality from those policy actions. Um, but in order to investigate this a little bit more, we wanted to find out whether the lakes that we saw significant improvements in had actually been subjected to any active management or restoration. And it turns out this is a lot more difficult to do for hundreds of lakes than one might think. Um, and that's just because there's really not great public records uh, that are related to being able to quantify management um, or restoration activities. And in fact, what we found is we had to lie, rely a lot on local newspaper reporting. So yet another reason to support our local papers. Um, 
but this local newspaper reporting, as well as a combination of um, government documents that we were able to find, we found that 65% of the lakes that had significant improvement also had been subjected to recent restoration efforts within their watershed or within the lake. Um, and so that uh, adds some evidence towards this idea that perhaps it is water quality intervention and policy that we're, we're seeing the benefits of here. But that being said, 11% of lakes are getting worse, 17% getting better. That leaves 72% of lakes that really aren't significantly changing, but do have trends in either the positive or the negative side, right? So looking at these distributions from the 323 lakes of magnitude, severity, and duration, we're seeing pretty normal distributions here. There's a lot of variability. And we wanted to investigate that a little bit more deeply. And so in order to do this, we fit sets of models um, where a bloom metric trend, whether it's, sorry, whether it was magnitude, severity, or duration, um, as the response variable, and the predictor variables included things like lake characteristics um, that were related to sediment water interaction, like surface area and lake depth, hydrologic connectivity, so the landscape position, whether that lake was drainage or seepage, and what the surface area to watershed area was. Nutrient availability, so nutrient concentrations, as well as trends in those nutrients over the time series that we are investigating, and the stoichiometric ratio. But we also looked at climate trends, so hydrologic intensification, in particular trends in extreme summer storm events and trends in mean summertime temperature. Additionally, we allowed, uh, um, so these were all fixed main effects and we considered all two-way interactions with time average chlorophyll A. And additionally, we allowed the lakes classification within the EPA level two eco regions to be a random effect on the intercept. So what did we find? Well, we found that a combination of lake characteristics and climate change variables help explain variability in algal bloom trends. So the higher um, chlorophyll A or the more green a lake is, the more likely it is to have a decreasing trend in bloom magnitude, as well as bloom severity. I'm only showing magnitude here. Whereas those with the lower mean, lower mean chlorophyll A are likely to um, be deteriorating. And this perhaps also um, fits with our hypothesis that water quality intervention, um, water policy, water quality policy is playing a role there and the lakes that are greener are the ones that are being more subjected to restoration and so therefore are more likely to be improving. Certainly possible, but needs to be investigated more. We also found that um, larger lakes were more likely to have increasing trends in bloom magnitude and severity. And this actually fits with a recent analysis by um, Ho and colleagues that was published in Nature last year that um, looked at large lakes globally and found that there were increasing trends in bloom severity. And, and so we also see that as well, that the larger the lake, the more likely to see an increasing trend in magnitude and severity. However, given the global dominance um, and numerical dominance of small lakes, our conclusion that widespread eutrophication and wide, or excuse me, that widespread algal bloom intensification is uh, not occurring is, is most likely uh, the case. And then finally, we saw a decreasing trend in magnitude if extreme precipitation events are increasing. But there was this really interesting interaction between precipitation and long-term average chlorophyll A. So the trend in blue magnitude is susceptible to changes in extreme precipitation events, particularly in eutrophic lakes. In other words, greener lakes, oh, those with a higher mean chlorophyll A, right, are also, that are also experiencing an increase in extreme precipitation are more likely to have an increasing trend in blue magnitude. However, greener lakes that are experiencing a declining trend in extreme precipitation have a strong declining trend in blue magnitude. So those are the lakes though, these green lakes, these eutrophic systems, the ones that have a loss of ecosystem services that we're trying to manage the most because of the threat to human health and ecosystem services. And it's possible that the effective nutrient management efforts could be magnified in watersheds that are experiencing less intense precipitation. So those efforts are being buoyed, but perhaps being overcome and potentially even reversed in watersheds that are experiencing precipitation intensification. And so it's these complex interactions of nutrient loading and climate change across scales that makes a uniform management solution for harmful algal blooms unrealistic. Um, 
what we saw was that extreme precipitation events are likely playing a role, particularly for lakes that are already eutrophic. And it's possible that those extreme precipitation events are doing things like modifying the timing and amount of external loading. And so perhaps um, erosion management may be important in that particular watershed. But it could also be the effect of the storm itself and the effect that it has on stratification as well as resuspension of sediments and that internal loading component. And it's likely to be lake specific. So managing eutrophic lakes, though, that are experiencing increasing precipitation is going to be particularly important um, to do uh, to consider that increasing extreme precipitation. Otherwise, that management is just going to be like running to stay in place. And in particular, I think it's important to think about increasing the resilience of these ecosystems, particularly in the face of global change. When we manage for short term benefits um, within an ecosystem, we're usually increasing the long term fragility of that ecosystem. In other words, when we manage to decrease the short term variability, um, we uh, generally find that we're increasing long term variability. And so that increases the fragility of that ecosystem and decreases its resilience. So we need to learn to tolerate variability and variability in harmful algal blooms from year to year, which can be difficult given how closely tied ecosystem services are to those bloom events. But we can also use information in that variability to adaptively manage our ecosystems and learn more about their resilience. So the anthropogenic acceleration of eutrophication in surface waters is likely is going to continue happening. Even though algal bloom intensification is not currently widespread, conditions are going to continue to change. We're going to see eutrophication continue to accelerate. Precipitation is also in particular going to continue to change here in the upper Midwest and influence nutrient loading. And as such, it's necessary to continue efforts to reduce eutrophication, promote restoration, and adaptively manage and to protect inland surface waters to prevent deterioration now and in the future, particularly in the face of global change. And with that, I think I have time for a few questions. I just want to mention, um, I have my email address here. Certainly feel free to send me an email. You could read more about this. Uh, this paper is coming out in Frontiers in Ecology and the Environment soon. You can email me for a preprint. And I want to thank our funding sources from the National Science Foundation. Thank you. Grace, thank you. I, uh, I always judge by how good the presentation is by did I learn anything? And I learned something and I was, I was uh, part of it. I was really encouraged. And then I was a little less encouraged in, in, in other parts of it. Well, thank, but, you. Uh, but thank you. And I learned uh, quite a bit. There's a, a number of questions here. I think we have uh, maybe 22 questions and I'm not sure, uh, sure which ones I ought to ask here. But I'm just going to jump in here, and uh, here's one that that I think that I'm interested in. Is I understand that you are using magnitude, severity, and duration as matrix of bloom intensification, but what made the 11% of lakes significantly worse versus just worse? Yeah, so that's a great question. So um, that significance was based on doing a based on a, uh, the p-value, so essentially doing a statistical test for whether or not that was a significant trend based on having an alpha level of 0.05 or 5%. So um, a, a strong, that uh, significant being used here in the sense of statistically significant. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, next, did you, did you look for consistencies in lake size? And building on that, have you thought about the possibility of expanding this model to brackish uh, uh, estrian areas. How did you factor in turbidity? And do you think this could be expanded to the above the aforementioned water bodies? That's the big question. Yeah. Um, yeah. So thinking about lake size, we did see that um, interaction between uh, bloom trends and that lakes that are larger um, were more likely to have increasing trends in bloom severity as well as magnitude. So there certainly seems to be an effect of lake size there. And we know that lake size could be correlated with uh, lots of different things um, and could also be um, interacting with lake depth, how much um, surface water interact, um, how much water and sediment interaction there is occurring there as well. And so there's certainly more to dive into. In terms of expanding this analysis um, to brackish waters and other waters, certainly one of our goals in creating these metrics was to really think holistically about um, how these metrics could be applied in other types of aquatic ecosystems. So certainly one could look at trends in magnitude, severity, and duration um, in relation to the um, 
excuse me, in relation to uh, brackish waters and, and the chlorophyll trends there. And uh, that's also why we chose to use um, chlorophyll uh, and that direct measurement. It, there was a question about turbidity, right? There can certainly be non-algal turbidity. And, and in many of the ecosystems that I worked in, particularly in Iowa, we do see a lot of that non-algal turbidity. Um, and so uh, we wanted to focus particularly on that algal component by using chlorophyll A. Um, if there, but Certainly, one, one could do a, a similar sort of analysis using these metrics of magnitude, severity, and duration, and looking at other water quality parameters like non-algal turbidity um, or secchi depth or things like that in order to understand just more broadly water quality trends. Okay, thank you. Question on statistical analysis. How were the difference in analysis or measurement method addressed in the chlorophyll A statistical analysis? Yeah, um, so I'm, I'm guessing this is in relation to um, the that there are different methods that folks use for measuring chlorophyll A. Um, so within that, we did not necessarily directly um, control for whether or not someone was, say, using uh, methanol extraction, fluorometric analysis versus using a probe or whatnot. We were just taking what was in the database in terms of chlorophyll A concentration that had been reported by the individual investigator. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Let's see, they keep, my, they keep jumping around. Uh, can the uh, use of satellite observations allow for a better lakes representative sample? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that uh, there certainly needs to be sort of a, a weight of evidence approach to this. And so some of the great work that I mentioned by Simon Topp and colleagues that has been looking at water clarity, um, but there are also other satellite methods, remote sensing methods, um, which I will, first and foremost say I'm not an expert in, but my understanding is there is a way to be able to use some of those bands to tease out things like chlorophyll A concentration with some gr ground truthing. Um, and so there's possibility um, to use that as well to look at more uh, random sampling of lakes to see how these trends um, hold. So yeah, absolutely. I think we sort of need a um, weight of evidence and multiple methods to be getting at this question and just understanding trajectories, long-term trajectories of lake water quality. There, there were several questions on zebra mussels and, uh, and some of them uh, were there, uh, one, one question was were basically were zebra, were zebra mussels actually helping improve water quality yeah, and that's a another one where zebra mussels may be clearing it and then clearing the water. And now we're seeing more algal blooms, which and then there was a, maybe another question or two along that same line. Your thoughts on that? Yes, absolutely. And this is something I think a lot about. Um, this is actually sort of a, a, a figure that I use to organize my thoughts and thinking that about how algal bloom trajectories are really the product of interacting drivers across scales. Um, and one of the next steps that we're hoping to do, my collaborators and I, is investigate this a little bit more deeply and really digging down into things like the influence of food web configuration as well as species invasion, thinking a lot about zebra mussels and um, both their population cycles, initial invasion, clearing of the water column, but then the role that they play in recycling of nutrients, as well as perhaps selective feeding and um, creating, um, there's been some work out there looking at whether or not zebra mussels contribute to more toxic algal blooms or more cyanobacteria dominated. And so um, I'm really interested in digging into that next. Uh, first thing we're gonna need to do is build a database of lake restoration and uh, species invasion that spans across states. And so um, I, I think that's sort of our, our next step and goal of where we're heading there so we can start to dig into more of these analyses and understand what these drivers might be that we don't have the best documentation of in a sort of tabular or quantitative format right now. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, I was, you know, in the North Central region, we have natural lakes and then we have reservoirs. Were there differences? Could, were they most, the ones you studied were they mostly natural lakes, reservoirs, or were there differences between them? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there were definitely um, both natural lakes as well as reservoirs, and we did look at that in our statistical analysis and didn't see a difference. Um, but we hope to, in the future, when expanding upon this, you know, we, we stuck with that 17 state region. There's a lot more data out there. The Lagos database um, was an amazing undertaking by the, the CSI limnology group led by Pat Serrano and other colleagues. And so we're really fortunate to be able to have that resource and be able to use it. But now I think there's, um, 
more uh, data that's getting put into that on a more continental scale as well as global databases. And I think we'll be able to address that question about um, maybe differences between natural lakes and reservoirs or really just thinking about hydrology as a continuum and the influence that that might have. Um, and so while we didn't see in this population of lakes a difference, that doesn't mean that there's not necessarily a hydrologic effect that we need to dig into more. Okay, thank you. You, uh, you talked about it a little bit, but uh, and it was really interesting on translating the science. Would, would you have any advice for, for conservation practitioners? Is there uh, any suggestion you would give on uh, what we ought to be doing differently or maybe what we're doing right? Yeah. Um, we're, well, we're, we're, we're really, really taking it out of you today. No, that's, I, you know, and, and that's the million or perhaps billion dollar question. Um, I, I think uh, one portion of that, so I'll try to kind of sidestep a little bit, sorry, very politician of me, um, but in the sense that one of the things I think is most important when thinking about harmful algal blooms and management is thinking about time scale. So if the goal of, and the time scale of management and the, and the goal is, so if the goal is uh, to be thinking about predicting or mitigating a specific bloom within a year, the time scale and the questions and um, that we're asking are gonna be different than if we're thinking about long-term decadal trajectories of that ecosystem. The drivers might be a little little bit different or the interactions might be different. And so um, the reason why I bring that up is because when we think about time scale and um, making sure that our management goals have a time scale to them, that might um, change the way or what drivers we choose to um, choose to manage for in order to get the outcomes that, that we want. So in other words, um, thinking about long-term algal bloom trajectories, precipitation in many regions is likely going to play a large role and that's out of our hands. And so it's thinking about the way that buffering against that increases in extreme precipitation is going to be more important, say, than um, perhaps other in-lake um, measures or whatnot that might be taken that might have a shorter term effect on harmful algal blooms, if that makes sense. So considering the importance of time scale. I've got a quick question for you on on your, all of your lakes. Is is do you have that published somewhere where they were, where the locations were, which lakes? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we actually, uh, and if if folks are interested in that, we have all of the data that we used as well as the code available, um, uh, freely available online, and I'm happy to share that. And so that includes those list of lakes um, and where they were located. Okay. One last question, and then I'll we'll let you yeah. relax. Um, uh, and we'll take a break. Algal, blo al algal blooms can be very dynamic. Have you seen any cases that some blooms were not caught within the 14 day interval in the measurement? Yeah, absolutely. And that's really what our rarefaction analysis um, demonstrated to us is, is there can certainly be where you have very fleeting or ephemeral blooms that occur. Um, and uh, first, I think that has to do with sort of what your definition of a bloom is which is important to think about. Um, but uh, 14 days is what we sort of landed on in that it captured the vast, in those 31 lake years that we looked at, it captured the vast majority of the bloom metrics um, ad accurately, um, although there were certainly instances where it was missed. In other words, the error was quite high. Um, and so I think uh, that's also another avenue and we're thinking about designing monitoring programs, what's the goal and the time scale of that monitoring program. For example, I have been working in Iowa for the past number of years with the DNR there and their lake monitoring program and we only monitor, we only visit each lake in the state, which is amazing spatial coverage, but three times per summer and that's not really adequate for capturing, say, the severity or the peak of a harmful algal bloom and we don't really get a lot of good information about the long-term mean. Um, and so when thinking about if the goal is harmful algal bloom monitoring, what the um, monitoring frequency needs to be in relation with reality and how much time and money is available is really important. So yes, there's certainly, I'm sure, peaks um, that are lost. You know, the peaks and severity is the one I worry the most about um, because we, we haven't seen perhaps that peak in the biomass, uh, but particularly for magnitude, it performed quite well in that 14 day return time. Okay, well, thank you, Grace. And before we go, there's, I don't know that I can answer the question. There was a question about, are the answers to these questions going to be posted in a text form? 
I don't know about that. I, I do know that this is being recorded. And uh, so I'll, I'll check on that and see what we can do, uh, what we're planning to do with the questions. We do still have 18 questions that we didn't get to. Yes, and I'd be happy to answer those in text form over the break, as many as I can. So okay, well, we'll try to do that. Thank you. Please so connect with me over email. Thank you. I wish we could give you a hand. Again, I learned something today, so I really appreciate it. So we're now going to take a break, and we will be starting right at 9:55 for the next session. So we get about nine or ten minutes here. So thank you again. You see mine? Lisa, I see it and I hear you fine. All right, perfect. Well, welcome, uh, thank you for the, the welcome. I'm uh, really excited to have the opportunity to talk to you all today about the science and monitoring that USGS is doing on harmful algal blooms. Um, across the country on behalf of the USGS Mid-Continent Region. As much as I would love to talk in detail about all the work we're doing, I'm really only gonna have some time to give you a high level overview of the different areas that we're working in and the approaches that are being taken. But for each of the topics I'm gonna to talk about, I have listed either a publication with more information or a USGS contact uh, that you can you know, reach out to to get some more information. Always feel free to you know, reach out to me though as well um, if you've got additional questions. Our USGS HAB Science crosses many of our different program areas um, and mission areas. Uh, all of our centers across the nation are working on this issue. And we're really focused on you know, three big goals. And these are our high level, developing standardized field and lab methods with robust QA, QC. This is really important because we also try to integrate and compare results across the country. So samples that are being collected by our center in Illinois can be compared to those that are also being collected um, in New York. And so we really have this um, need to have these methods um, that are standardized, but also flexible enough to accommodate the changing technology and, and be able to implement that at a research level. Speaking of the research, we've got a very strong monitoring and research focus that are designed to address the casual factors associated with HABs, fate and transport, ecological process, effects of exposure, with ultimate goal of being able to define what are the risks that are out there, both the ecosystem and the human health risks, and can we develop early prediction or decision-making tools for managers to address this uh, nationwide issue. It's important to note that the harmful part of harmful algal blooms can really be described in many different ways. And there's a different harm depending on what your ecosystem service might be or your endpoint of concern. And so this might be um, an excess of biomass depleting oxygen or exposure to a toxin being produced. So one of our programs in the, the USGS is the Environmental Health Program. It's a toxins alcohol health um, integrated science team. And this team is really looking at the toxin part of harmful algal blooms and how the exposure may affect human and animal health. The Environmental Program has developed this integrated team of biologists, hydrologists, um, geneticists uh, to really investigate the health effects associated with toxin exposure. Um, and really it's, if you're exposed to a certain degree, at what point might you see an effect? The drivers of toxin production, um, you know, beyond just the, the nutrient drivers. And then, as I mentioned before, those laboratory methods are, are constantly being, um, you know, in development phase. And so right now we've got a subset of toxins that we're analyzing for. How do we get to a way where we can measure a robust set of toxins that have health implications? And then finally, this, this project has an interesting component and that's the decision support in particular, how we bring socioeconomics into decision-making. And so part of this project um, does look at how do we um, we know what the risks are, but how do we put some dollar amounts on that to understand 
what the economic impacts, how are decisions being made? Because that ultimately is gonna be a big part of dealing with this, this issue. We know from other program studies the importance of new transfer hubs, but also recognizing that nutrients alone cannot fully explain toxin occurrence. Not all blooms produce toxins and toxins have been detected in areas where nutrients are low. So the environmental health program is looking at some non-nutrient drivers. And these include atmospheric dust, volcanic ash, forest fire, uh, forest fire ash, metals, micronutrients, and even antimicrobial or other contaminants that have potential to directly influence toxin production by activating or deactivating key cellular processes or indirect directly by creating a competitive environment for different microorganisms that might allow for toxin producers to outcompete non-toxin producers or vice versa. And leading to one of the key goals of the environmental health program on understanding the effects of toxin exposure Biologists in multiple of our centers are using different species and are looking at the effects following exposure. In addition, we're working at looking at biomarkers that could be used for early detection and assessing the bioaccessibility uh, in different tissues to address biological and consumption concerns. And so for all of this work, um, We've got Keith Lofton on Kansas Water Science Center, along with myself, leading really a large group of, of scientists. And so when, if you have any questions on this, please feel free to, to reach out and we can get you some more information. There'll be many publications coming out in the next year. This project, this team is about two and a half, three years old. Um, and so a lot of this work is still ongoing. One of our other major USGS programs is the Water Resource Availability Program. And this supports assessment of the occurrence and factors that drive algal blooms through evaluation of emerging approaches and technologies, regional national scale studies. In addition, we have a cooperative matching program that allows us to partner with local state and tribal agencies to really monitor and model and forecast the occurrence of potential harmful algal blooms at their level. Before I kind of went into a lot of the, the studies, I did want to recognize that the region has three USGS labs. And so I kind of wanted to talk about what their capabilities are because the, all three of these labs are very instrumental in the data analysis for many of the projects I'm gonna talk about. The first is the USGS Algal and Environmental Toxins Lab located in Kansas Water Science Center. Uh, Keith Lofton is the lead for this group. And they're using multiple approaches for algal toxin detection. And while the focus is on commonly found toxins, this group is also working on the understudied toxin and developing new methods to detect multiple toxin in different matrices. They're also working on, you know, taking this technology to, you know, connect that to the metabolomics, proteomics um, associated with toxin production. And that's going to connect to the next two labs. The first is the U.S. Michigan micro bacteriological laboratory. And they're using advanced sequencing and bioinformatics to understand the microbial communities and how these communities influence harmful algal blooms and toxin productions, how they change to different changing environmental conditions and what those end results might be. The thought is that by understanding the community, we can understand what's actually happening in at this molecular level to induce toxin production and maybe inform early indications of when there's a hazard. The third lab is the USGS Ohio Water Microbiology Lab, which has a focus on developing methods for detection of genes associated with algal toxins or algal toxin producing species, such as microcystin and microcystis. Um, they're using both a presence, absence, and quantitative PCR approach which allows us to either say, is something there? Or, and, and also, what is the relative quantification of those genes in the environment? They're also developing methods to move us from DNA into RNA. DNA is a great marker um, out in the environment. It tells us what the potential is, but RNA is really what's telling us what genes are turned on. So a gene can be present, but not necessarily doing anything out in the environment when we detect it through some traditional methods. By moving to RNA, a little bit more difficult, we're able to say, go from that just is it present to is it actually on? Is microcystin likely being produced here 
or is there just that potential? So I'm gonna transition into some of our national and regional studies. USGS has worked with our federal partners on national studies in lakes, rivers, and streams. And on the right, oh, sorry. And on the right-hand side, you'll see a list of several publications. And I apologize, and all of these have a link. So if you're interested in a publication, please let me know so that I can get that to you. But USGS has worked with our federal partners into basically assessing on a large national scale. We're looking at uh, lakes, streams, rivers, and so really all of these different water resources. The take home message here is that there's abundance of toxin algal bloom data being collected throughout the US and in different water resources. And so to give you a taste of just a little bit of this, I'm gonna present some results that have been published by Keith Lofton and group on the National Lake Assessment. The National Aquatic Resource Surveys is a collaborative program between EPA, the states, and the tribes designed to assess the quality of the nation's coastal waters, lakes, and reservoirs, rivers and streams, and wetlands using a statistical survey design. The USGS Kansas Algal Toxin Lab worked with this program to analyze toxins in these water resources. And this figure is from a 2007 National Lake Assessment. Each assessment is done in each of these water bodies about every five years. From these results, we can see that microcystin was the most frequently detected toxin analyzed. But notice that the number of detections in the north central region for saxitoxin, an occasional occurrence of slindrospermopsin. So while the focus is largely on microcystin, we don't want to lose sight of these other toxins. And I think this is why really when we're looking at toxins on a national suite, we want to make sure we are focused on as many toxins that we can, because as present, Grace presented, we may see some changes in what these, these look like over time, particularly with climate change. In a similar study by Jennifer Graham and all, they looked at a, large rivers. And so this publication just recently came out um, and they're looking at not just the toxins, but also those toxin genes that I mentioned. And so in this figure, you can see that, that they looked at microcystin, anatoxin, saxitoxin, and cylindrospermopsin genes. In the figure, the pi icons represent the toxin genes, and then the center triangles represents the toxin detection of microcystin in, in green, and if both anatoxin and microcystin were detected in pink. For the large rivers, the genes were detected much more frequently than the toxins themselves which isn't completely surprising. This has been documented in several other studies, but we still need to do more work to understand the implications of these genes in the environment. Do they serve as an early indicator for toxins? Or perhaps the genes are more ubiquitous in the environment, such as cyan since cyanobacteria are naturally occurring organisms. So this is the importance of going from now this, this DNA-based approach to now these RNA approaches so we do know whether or not these toxin genes are turned on in producing toxin. So this brings us to some of our exciting partner-driven projects. And this is the heart of a lot of our center, um, in center work that's being done in the mid-continent region. And when we're working with our partners, what we found is that the, the questions that they really are asking are, when and where are algal bloom and toxins occurring? Can we predict this? Can we predict HABs to provide early warnings to, to those um, at using these water resources? And what is the cause? Can we control it, mitigate it, or prevent it? So one of our first projects is our sister agency in the DOI, the National Park Service. And so the National Park Service has identified HABs as a major concern across many of their parks. So we're really working with them to help provide data and tools to meet their management needs of low cost method detections and also data to help establish threshold for making decisions. Vicki Christensen and James Larson um, have done some phenomenal work with the Park Service um, in the region and they continue to work on the with the parks addressing some Unique situations look at diol variations in anatoxin and saxitoxin, 
um, detection of blooms by remote sensing, and also understanding the relationship between water levels and cyanotoxins. And interestingly, trying to get a better understanding of what do these cyanotoxin mixtures in the environment mean? Very seldom do we find just one toxin. A lot of times we do find these multiple toxins. And are they additive? Do they provide, do they pre present more of a risk, which is still unknown? In the Great Lakes, we know that phosphorus, particularly soluble reactive phosphorus, is a major driver in algal bloom formation. And while the pursuit for nutrient reductions is critical for hab control, there are also alternative management strategies that are going to be needed in conjunction with the nutrient reduction. As I mentioned previously, this is an example where nutrients appear to be the primary driver for algal toxins in Western Lake Erie. However, what is unknown is the relation between the nutrient conditions and toxin production. So here we have the theory that if we decrease nutrients, we'll decrease the algal biomass, which will then lead to a lower probability of high toxin concentrations in the, in the lake. And while this may be true, the questions of how long will it take, at what level do nutrients need to be reduced to achieve that endpoint goal, we just don't understand some fundamental, under, we don't have a fundamental understanding of why those toxins are being produced. So if you decrease the bloom, will you truly see a decrease in toxin? So what we've been looking at is what are the other environmental factors associated not just with bloom biomass, how much cyanobacteria can be measured, but how much toxin is present? And what is the lag between when we detect a biomass or measure something in the lake as an environmental condition such as nutrients and when toxins become of concern? We're looking at using genetic data to help inform this in the sense that a microbial community analysis would give us an idea of who's there and how is that changing over time? Because they're the early response. They're that response that we're not seeing first. And so as we see that community shift, can we relate that to a shift in environmental conditions? And is who's there important? Are they driving each other to select for certain cyanobacteria that may become more problematic? In addition, the idea that we have a bloom, what happens to that bloom at the end of the bloom season? Well, it typically settles. And so now do we see a seeding? Do we see a situation where this year's bloom is actually going to influence next year's bloom? And so the, we're looking at not just the water column, but also the sediment to get an idea of how nutrients control this situation, but also how do some of these other factors influence the Lake Erie bloom. Much of this work is in an interpretive phase at this point um, and publications are should be coming out shortly, but if you do have any questions on it, I'd be happy to talk more about this project in, in greater detail. Now I showed you that National Lake Assessment, which represents ambient conditions. This, these are kind of a, a statistical approach. And so it's not targeting a problem like they were targeting just looking at the general conditions at a, at a given point in time. So similarly, we conducted some regional studies to look at toxin mix, uh, mixtures. Now, not just randomly, but in blooms in areas where we know that they're there to be an issue. So in a recent study in the Midwest, we can see that microcystin occurred in all algal blooms sampled, but other cyanotoxins occurred in 30% of the samples. Of interest, cylindrospermopsin and saxitoxin, occurrence in this study is generally similar to what we saw in the 2000 National Lake Assessment samples. So at the regional level where we're targeting blooms, the amount of toxin that we're seeing is, is in similar concentrations. And so this is work that's being done out of the Kansas Water Science Center. In 2012, the USGS conducted an initial reconnaissance of lakes in Illinois, in which microcystins were detected the most frequently, and they were found in 85% of the water bodies sampled. The highest concentration detected, notably, was 4,800 micrograms per liter, which, for those of you working with toxins, know that that's a really high concentration. Results, when you compare them to the World Health Organization guidelines, 
which are based on the probability of acute health effects. And so when you look at the, the table, what's in red are those that you know, would be the highest risk. And that's gonna be based on two different criteria. You can use it based on total cyanobacteria that you collect or the total model microcystin. And so the study compared the results that were obtained in the environment to these two thresholds, which were kind of the go-to thresholds at the time. So what you see is each circle identifies a risk zone based on the microcystin concentration on the top and the total cyanobacteria concentration on the bottom. Green being low, low risk, yellow moderate, orange high, and red very high. And unfortunately, there was that lake that had that high concentration up in the northern part of Illinois that really that did reach that high risk threshold. But many of the, but many of those, um, so all but two of the high risk based total cyanobacteria based on the excuse me, let me back up a second. In addition to that high, that very high, there were several others that were also in a high category or moderate category. So those that were in the high risk on total cyanobacteria cell counts, but were considered a low risk for microcystin concentrations. And this is really important to define, how are you defining the risk or the harm for your water bodies? And I empathize with those managers out there who, who really are trying to assess which of these criteria do I use? And so part of these studies is to give managers a better assessment of what do we see and what are, the, what are the risks and what are those risks over time? And can that be done in a predictive way to help you make a decision? We know things like drought conditions accompanied hot temperatures in 2012, which might have affected development of persistence of cyanobacteria blooms. So here was a snapshot in 2012, it's still ongoing. So we'll have more to come on this study. Heading further up north, the USGS Upper Midwest Water Science Center has a similar regional focus to understand the geospatial extent of toxins and is partnered with the state agencies. And these studies include a variety of different sampling methods and technologies, including a new technology of looking at passive samplers, which collect the water and look at what's present over a longer exposure period, rather than just that instantaneous grab sample. It's also employing um, other real-time sensors and phycocyanin probes that in, in hopefully is gonna be used to develop predictive capabilities and early warning systems for these lakes. The sensor platforms and toxin analysis have also been expanded to Michigan lakes not shown here um, to broaden the geographic um, area and to give us a good comparison now um, in these glacial lakes across the upper Midwest. So moving out of the field data collection and now into some of the other, um, the hyperspectral imagery the, and remote sensing part of the, the presentation, USGS is working on developing the technologies that we can deploy to for rapid assessment, for early indicators, for forecasting and prediction. And so one of those is developing an imagery database that allows us to identify by different cyanobacteria species. This would allow managers to have a better sense of what the intensities are and not only how intense a bloom might be right now done on chlorophyll, but also what type of bloom, what type of cyanobacteria are you dealing with and therefore what potential do you have for toxin production? The big push right now is a lot of the satellite work. So USGS has been working with EPA, NASA, and NOAA to develop and validate, validate a tool called Cyan, which is a cyanobacteria assessment network. This is a phytoplankton plankton and cyanobacteria bloom detection system that would inform light conditions across the country and inform how conditions may be changing over time. It provides lake managers a tool for assessment and researchers a tool to evaluate large scale data sets spatially, temporally in relation to other environmental factors. Currently you have, they're working on, there's a desktop application and they're working on a remote um, uh, 
handheld application. And so if you, and Keith Lofton's the USGS lead for this work, if you've got any additional questions. We're in the process right now of working to validate this. And this is now connecting the satellite technology and tool approach to now saying, how accurate are we when we get down to the field scale? And Kansas Water Science Center has, has leading this effort um, on a regional scale to verify the utility of the on the ground field data collection. And so there's a set of lakes that they'll be sampling and then relating that to the cyan results to say how accurate are these predictions. And this will hopefully give the man, like lake managers a tool and, and not only a tool, but a understanding what that tool can tell them and what it can't. So into the nutrients, we know nutrients are an important driver for HABs. And the USGS is a leader in collecting the nutrient, nutrient data, um, both concentrations and load across the country. But what we're really finding is that we really need, in order to refine our models, we have to have increased knowledge on what are the sources? What is the species of nutrients being delivered? And what's that fate and transport of them through the watershed, through the watershed into our large rivers and lakes? We're also working with land managers to evaluate the effects of different nutrient management strategies, both in the ag and the urban setting, to understand can we reach the goal nutrient criteria that is being established or that managers are, are, are hoping to get to. With the thought, again, that reducing nutrients will reduce a bloom that will reduce toxin. Uh, but we can't monitor Lisa, everywhere. Lisa, yeah. just a few more minutes here. Yep, I, I've got just a couple more. Okay. So. You. We are working at, um, you, can't, you can't collect samples everywhere and we know that. So now it's how do we develop water quality monitors and real-time sensors that can give us a larger breadth of information, both spatially and temporally. And so we're working at using water quality sensors. And so the, if you go to our NWIS database, they, we do have chlorophyll already in there. And so that gives us one indication related to HABs. These are being used to develop models that relate to the environmental factors that now can actually give you a forecast system. Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana Water Science Center has been using this for beach E. coli monitoring and now is looking at applying this to cyanobacteria toxins with some success. And I wanna kind of wrap it up, bringing it back to Illinois. Illinois has started with this, these super gauges and they've been working with the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency and have established a network that monitors for nutrients and other continuous parameters on all the major rivers leaving the state of Illinois. The network is set up as part of the Illinois Nutrient Loss Reduction Strategy and the data is being used from not only these gauges but other water quality gauges in the watershed to help track HABs on the Illinois River. Data being collected include parameters such as chlorophyll, orthophosphate, nitrate, turbidity, temperature, dissolved oxygen, pH, specific conductance, and gauge height and discharge. So this will become a foundational piece of how do we take these networks that we are now developing in the states and, and define and apply this more broadly across the US. So I'm going to end here on a, a recent, um, a new program with USGS, which is the Next Generation Observing Systems. For those that love acronyms, this one will be called NGWAS. And it's to provide high temporal and spatial resolution um, on, our, on the water resources. This started as a pilot in the Delaware River Basin. And recently, the Upper Colorado was added for, in the West and the Illinois River Basin was just recently announced to represent the central part of the US. The Illinois River Basin provides an opportunity to implement an NGWAS system um, challenged by an abundance of nutrients associated with harmful algal blooms. And so this is going to be a focal point. It's just beginning. And over the course of this next year, USGS will be engaging in a broader, broader internal and external stakeholder engagement. So we'll be reaching out to many of you to develop a science and monitoring plan for the Illinois River Basin that will gear towards dealing with those management issues. And so these will be deploying a network of 
um, state-of-the-art sensors, looking at not just the field sensors, but air and satellite as well. And so that's all I have. So I thank you for your time today. Again, USGS has a lot going on. I wish I could get into a lot more details, but if you have any questions, please, um, you can connect to any of the contacts you saw on the slides, or if you want more information on a particular topic, you can email me and I can get you into the right direction. Okay, well, Lisa, Lisa, thank you so much for your presentation. Again, I learned something. So it was, so for me, it was very useful to hear you. There's a, we won't have time today. There's a number of questions on there. And, uh, it, and I might ask if you get, if you have time, maybe so type some short answers on there if you get a chance today. Some of them are, are pretty long questions. You may not be able to do that. If you can, that would be, that would be great. And if you could maybe, uh, I'm not sure, maybe go back to my screen possibly or stop I'm sharing yours. I'm trying to find my do not share button. I just had it. Dan, you should be able to share yours now. I'm looking for mine here now also. Let's see. Okay. Okay, there we go. Okay, our next speaker, and, and again, uh, Lisa, thank you for your presentation. We're gonna move on to our next speaker now. It's uh, our next speaker is Gina uh, La Liberata, and if I, not, if I don't say that right, I apologize, Gina. She leads the response and communication on harmful algal bloom issues as, a har as the harmful algal blooms coordinator for the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. She is a BS in biology and an MS in resource ecology management from the University of Michigan. Uh, Gina is gonna to talk to, the, to us today about uh, HAB tracking and management, Wisconsin's approach. And so I will, I'm gonna stop sharing here and hand it over to you, Gina. All right. There we go. And I think you should be able to see my screen now. I see you and I hear you fine. Thank you. Okay, excellent. And you can see my presentation. My slide. Yes, I see it fine. Okay, great, great. Thank you. Well, uh, thank, thank you for inviting me to present at this conference. Um, before I give you sort of a flavor of some of the things that we're doing in Wisconsin to track and manage harmful algal blooms, I wanted to give a plug for the ITRC's Harmful Cyanobacterial or HCB team. Um, I'm one of the 90 state members on this team that was sponsored by ITRC or the Interstate Technology and Regulatory Council in 2019. And the aim of this team was to focus on freshwater and estuarine planktonic cyanobacteria and to develop a document with technical and regulatory guidance um, that covers harmful cyanobacterial bloom monitoring, uh, communication and response, in lake management such as treatment, and nutrient reduction strategies for, for HCBs. Uh, this document will be released to the public in March of 2021 on this website, itrcweb.org. And ITRC is also going to offer free online training in um, a, a, a two sessions on April 13th and April 29th of 2021. So uh, there's information on signing up for that online training at itrcweb.org. And uh, you'll probably get notices of the availability of the document and the training as well through multiple uh, channels such as you probably received uh, used for uh, getting notification of, of this this conference so uh, watch watch your inbox for information on the release of the document and training and I also wanted to let you know that if you're interested in participating in the benthic harmful cyanobacterial team uh, it's actually open for registration at ITR 
grcweb.org. And um, that's going to be a one year team that uh, takes the the everything that's been put forth in the current uh, guidance document, we're going to be focusing on benthic uh, harmful cyanobacterial blooms and uh, adding some enhanced information for, for that as well. So uh, that's itrcweb.org if you're interested. So I'm going to uh, talk now about uh, just give you a taste of some of the aspects of uh, bloom monitoring that we have in Wisconsin. And uh, one of the primary things that I've been involved with is the Wisconsin Harmful Algal Bloom Surveillance Program. Uh, so this was started in 2009 and it serves, serves a, as a partnership for between the Wisconsin Department of Health Services, uh, specifically their Division of Public Health, the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources and the Wisconsin State Laboratory of Hygiene. And uh, this program serves to investigate human and animal illnesses that are potentially related to cyanobacterial toxin exposure. And the way this uh, program usually works is the Department of Health Services receives illness reports. They have a reporting form on their website to receive reports directly. They get reports directly from local public health agencies and uh, state agencies. And uh, they evaluate they evaluate symptoms. So one, one other route that they have for reports is um, through the Wisconsin Poison Center. So if people consult the Poison Center for information on cyanobacterial toxin poisoning, those incidents get routed to Department of Health Services. And I should also note that since 2017, uh, cyanobacterial toxicosis has been a reportable condition in the state of Wisconsin. So uh, that is uh, a way for uh, Department of Health Services, the Department of Health Services to get reports directly from clinicians through their uh, reporting database. So um, when, once DHS gets illness reports, they evaluate uh, symptoms for consistency with uh, uh, cyanobacterial exposure. Um, they have multiple questions about uh, what the environmental conditions were at the time of exposure. And if those things seem consistent with cyanobacterial toxin exposure, then they, they work with me and I work with our regional uh, Department of Natural Resources biologists to uh, do sampling at the water body uh, where people or pets or wildlife are exposed. And we try to do that as close to uh, the time of exposure as possible. In some cases, we get reports like a couple of weeks after exposure, um, environmental conditions are going to have changed significantly since then. So we, we aren't always able to do follow-up monitoring. But when we do, uh, those samples are analyzed by the Wisconsin State Laboratory of Hygiene, which has capacity to do cyanobacterial enumeration and identification and uh, toxin analysis. So they can do screening tests using ELISA for, for classes of cyanotoxins. And if necessary, uh, they can analyze a number of uh, microcystin congeners, uh, anatoxin congeners, um, cylindrospermopsin, and saxitoxin uh, with uh, HPLC MSMS. Uh, so once we get the results, usually with usually um, which we get the fastest are cyanobacterial identification and enumeration, uh, cyanotoxin screening results. I get that and then I communicate those results back to state agencies and local pu public health agencies and anyone else who uh, needs, to, needs to be notified. I, co I coordinate that uh, reporting out. Now this program isn't really intended for routine monitoring purposes. Um, we don't really have the capacity right now um, as a state agency to do statewide monitoring since we've got uh, about 10,000 lakes that, that get significant recreational use in our state. Um, but quite often we get our results uh, in a very timely fashion. So uh, local public health agencies are able to use that information for making public health decisions. So whether to issue an advisory, close a beach, et cetera. Um, so Wisconsin is a home rule state, uh, which means that it's local public health ag agencies and tribal public health agencies that have the authority to do uh, beach closures within their jurisdiction. It's, it's 
something where we don't have the jurisdiction to do at the, the state level in Wisconsin, with the exception of uh, state park and state forest beaches, where the Department of Natural Resources has that jurisdiction. So that's the Wisconsin Harmful Algal Bloom Surveillance Program. We do get a number of cases reported to us and uh, um, we do have a number of uh, sampling events associated with this every year. One of the really significant outcomes of the partnership that we have with the Wisconsin Harmful Algal Bloom Surveillance Program is uh, in development of out outreach materials. In the past few years, I've been really lucky to work with Amanda Cook at Department of Health Services, who's been really great in spearheading a number of outreach um, efforts uh, to public health agencies. One of the things that we work on every year is a pre joint presentation at the Wisconsin Lakes and Rivers Convention. Uh, this convention is held yearly, and a significant number of attendees are lake homeowners. So this is a really great way for us to reach uh, people who have uh, lakefront properties. Another thing that we, we do on a yearly basis are seasons in the middle of uh, webinars, excuse me, in the middle of bloom season. So typically we schedule this for, for late June through, through mid July, just as harmful algal blooms are starting to pop up on lakes. And quite often there is a lot of media interest uh, associated with, with blooms being reported in different media outlets as well. Amanda's done a really great job at developing a monthly public health new newsletter that goes to uh, public health agencies on a monthly basis. And uh, one of the great things that she's done with this newsletter is to develop a sample um, sample social media posts that uh, local agencies can can post to their their agency's uh, Facebook page, for example. Another thing that we like to do is DNR and Department of Health Services work on joint social media posts, especially when we have really high profile um, uh, stories such as uh, the dog deaths that uh, were being reported uh, nationally in August of 2019 that really created a lot of, of interest at the, the local level as well. So, so joint social media posts. Uh, we've also worked on public health presentations to uh, local and tribal public health agencies. Uh, this is a uh, uh, slide from the Blooms in the Big Lake workshop uh, that took place in April of 2019 that was aimed towards uh, local public health agencies and tribal public health agencies in the Lake Superior Basin uh, in response to some of the blooms that have been occurring in Lake Superior. And another thing that Amanda uh, spearheaded is development of new signage for for use in Wisconsin, and uh, these are actually available to public health agencies as uh, low cost uh, permanent uh, metal signs that they can purchase uh, at at uh, really really decent uh, cost. So if you want information about the signs or some of these public health outreach uh, efforts, uh, check out uh, the Department of Health Services. Uh, blue green algae page and look at the for professionals link. Uh, one of the things that we started doing at uh, DNR a couple of years ago is we implemented a uh, bloom reporting uh, email address. One of the things that we have in the works for this year is expanding this to an online reporting form that also uh, maps where blooms have been reported in the state. But for now, we've got this, this email address, and these maps show uh, blooms that have been reported to us through various means, either that email address uh, directly to me or uh, through, through people just reaching out from the DNR website or from uh, county and, and state agencies as well. So the green dots on these maps show planktonic blooms or wind-driven accumulations. So I wanna point out that this, does, this is absolutely not any sort of indication of the size or intensity of a bloom, it's just the occurrence of a bloom. Uh, one of the things that gets reported to us quite often are these wind-driven accumulations where floating cyanobacterial scums are concentrated at uh, downed wind shores. And they're not necessarily large blooms, but they are they are shown on this map. Uh, the other thing are floating benthic mats uh, of cyanobacterial um, 
species that form mats on the bottom of lakes, typically in, in lakes with very clear water. So this seems counterintuitive to people sometimes. My lake has clear water, why do I have this bloom? In many cases, it's these floating benthic mats, and they do tend to occur a lot in northern Wisconsin in lakes with, uh, with clear water. So this shows where blooms and mats have been reported 2018 through 2020. Uh, we do have a fairly good scatter, and one thing I will note that does surprise people at times is yes, we do have blooms on occasion in, in northern Wisconsin. We do have a number of lakes that do have high nutrient levels that can support uh, some support large blooms. It, but in many cases, these planktonic blooms are these wind driven accumulations as well. One of the things that we've been starting to use uh, for enhancing our ability to track blooms in Wisconsin is remote sensing. Uh, we're very lucky that uh, Rick Stumpf at NOAA has developed a uh, cyanobacterial product very similar to what is available available for Lake Erie that shows uh, blooms the, using the cyanobacterial index in Lake Winnebago, our largest inland lake in Wisconsin that has high nutrient levels and is frequently um, impacted by significant blooms and in lower Green Bay as well. So this has been a great tool for us to, to use to, to track blooms and we actually get, can get a daily feed of uh, cyanobacterial blooms with this, uh, this product. The other thing that we've been using is the, uh, the cyan product um, from EPA, NASA, NOAA, and USGS, which uses uh, data from Landsat and European Space Agency uh, satellites. Um, one thing that's sort of limiting about the cyan product is uh, it has to be larger lakes in order to have a valid sensing of cyanobacterial blooms. Uh, so in Wisconsin, that means about 150 of our largest lakes can be accurately sensed using this, this cyan product. Um, but this is great because it's now available to Android users, so anyone in the public can use it. And um, this uh, there's also a web platform that's in development that will be available for everyone, and I believe that is uh, scheduled for um, uh, public public release sometime this year. So science been really useful for us in, in enhancing our tracking of blooms with satellites. So to give you an idea of what that looks like for 2020, uh, again, using that, that same uh, scheme as the previous maps, the green circles are either planktonic blooms, which can be either large or smaller wind-driven accumulations. The squares are floating benthic mats of cyanobacteria. So these are just the reports that we get through, through the email and, and other means. And this map on this side are the lakes in which we had satellite detected blooms. So again, this is that subset of about 150 of the largest lakes in Wisconsin. And this is for 2020 through about the end of August. So you can see that these, these satellite detected blooms are filling in some areas where we're not necessarily getting reports. And uh, to combine all of the reports that we get, um, I know this, this section uh, delves into identification, which is something that I'm really interested in, especially um, how the public perceives what, our, what cyanobacterial blooms are. Uh, one of the things that we ask for um, when people are reporting blooms is photographs for, for verification. This is really important because in many cases, people mistake uh, floating mats of filamentous green algae for cyanobacteria. There are other things that, uh, that can cause sort of bloom conditions as well. So uh, this, this map sh shows all the reports of blooms and bloom-like occurrences that we had in Wisconsin through August 2020. 20 excuse me, August 25th last year. So again, those green dots are planktonic cyanobacterial blooms or wind-driven accumulations. Uh, the blue squares are floating benthic mats. These orange diamonds are filamentous green algae. Uh, we typically get those reports early in the spring. We did have uh, one lake that had discolored water in northeastern Wisconsin that ended up being a some sort of bloom that was caused by either dinoflagellate algae or chrysophyte algae. 
strategy. And additionally, I've included purple sulfur bacteria here. We've had a couple of uh, lakes with uh, floating mats of that as well. Um, and these can actually sort of masquerade as a, a cyanobacterial bloom called Planktothrix rubescens. I've also included a couple of reports that we had of duckweed or water meal. These are floating aquatic plants that are also quite often mistaken by the public for cyanobacterial blooms. So that's all the reports that we had through August 25 last year. Um, well, Grace, Grace did a great job of addressing this, this question, are blooms more frequently occurring? Um, we, we do have some worldwide evidence of this, but as Grace pointed out in her presentation, uh, there, there's a lot of nuance to that question and, and how you address it. Uh, we do know that in Wisconsin, uh, the trends that we have in our changing climate are leading to conditions that will uh, really support the expansion of blooms in the future. Um, these, these three graphs here are from the Wisconsin Initiative on Climate Change Impacts Report from 2011. They show past trends in our annual average temperature, the length and season of the growth length of the growing season and days and average annual precipitation. And these are all, these, these maps show trends from 1950 through 2006. So these are changes that have already been occurring. So we know that Wisconsin is getting warmer since 1950. Uh, that will lead to warmer water temperatures that will support more growth of cyanobacteria. We have an extension of our growing season. This longer ice-free growing season can also help to exacerbate uh, blooms occurring because uh, they don't die off if they're able to keep going during the winter. And uh, a short ice on period really gives them a jump start on growing in the spring. And additionally, heavy rains and snow melt can bring extra nutrients into system. And, into the aquatic systems and Wisconsin is getting warmer. And in particular, we're having in the Midwest, we're seeing more rain falling in these single a day events. Uh, this has been happening since about the, the mid 1980s. The Midwest has seen uh, about a 42% increase in these heaviest 1% uh, events. So rainfall in excess of one, one to two inches. And uh, this is having an effect on blooms in some of our inland lakes but is also having an effect in our Great Lakes as well, particularly in Lake Superior. You don't normally think of Lake Superior as having cyanobacterial blooms, but since, excuse me, since uh, 2012, we have been seeing uh, nearshore blooms occurring in some years. So um, this, Evidently, we have uh, some anecdotal evidence before 2012, but 2012 was the, the bloom that really made us sit up and take notice. Um, there was a, a significant rainstorm in the Duluth uh, Superior area um, from June 19th to 20th. It was about a 500 year uh, intensity rain event. You can see these sediment plumes that because of the circulation patterns are traveling along the um, the south shore of, of the lake uh, in this uh, Noah Modus image from July 1st. This was al also in a very, very warm period in, uh, in July. And um, in around mid-July, uh, we had reports of a bloom here, uh, very close to the Apostle Island, Ellen's National Lake Shore. Uh, we had samples, I looked at them, it ended up being this particular species called Delicospermum lemmermanii. So it's a form formerly known as Anabina, Anabina lemmermanii, but it's now in the genus Delicospermum. So this was blooming in this near shore area. And these blooms have occurred um, several, several years since then. Uh, they tend to occur in years when uh, ice cover is low, which allows the, the lake to, to warm up very rapidly in the spring. And the most significant uh, bloom that we saw was in 2018 in August. Uh, so here's Bob Sterner's tweet about a perhaps unprecedented surface algal bloom at Lake Superior Shore at Cornucopia. You can see how green this water is. Here is Brenda Maresca Lefrancois' photo of that beach at Cornucopia. You can see the sort of pea soup looking water in this, this sampling bottle. That's really not what you think of when you think of Lake Superior's water. You think of clear water that uh, is not green and pea soup like. But in this particular case, this was another delicious Spermum lemmermanii bloom, and this particular bloom actually made the news in the New York Times at the end of August. Um, 
So this has been a concern to, to many people, many agencies in the area. Uh, since, since, that, uh, since that bloom, the Lake Superior Partnership Partnership has had this uh, algal bloom subgroup of a number of agencies and representatives, including uh, tribal and federal agencies, including uh, a Canadian agency, state agencies, uh, university partners, and, and other partners uh, who have uh, gotten together to, to share research, uh, coordinate uh, sampling, and um, attempt to uh, capture these blooms because they can be very ephemeral, uh, lasting just a, a couple of days. So that's, that's what's going on in Lake Superior. We have other efforts in, in Green Bay uh, looking at blooms that I don't have time to go into detail about. And we've also at the DNR been involved in looking at uh, the green alga Clodophora as a nuisance bloom in uh, Lake Michigan as well. Um, so I'm going to talk a very briefly about uh, some of our, our management strategies for blooms. So we, we know what leads to blooms. We know that excess nutrients, so phosphorus and nitrogen, can fertilize bloom growth. And when you tend to have blooms is when you have warm water in the summer and calm weather that really promote scum formation. And in Wisconsin, it tends to be our shallow reservoirs and impoundments that are particularly vulnerable to blooms. Uh, we have a number of large impoundments which drain very large watersheds uh, with a lot of nutrients in them. They, they tend to have a lot of blooms. Uh, even sh smaller shallow reservoirs can be vulnerable as well because that water can uh, warm up very quickly to temperatures that, that favor cyanobacterial growth. Uh, but one thing that I really try to emphasize to the public is that any water body can have a bloom because cyanobacteria are in all water bodies. Um, there's sort of this concept sometimes to the public that is a lake positive or negative for, for cyanobacteria. Yes, it's positive because they're, they're everywhere. They're in mud puddles, they're, they're everywhere. So um, what is the Wisconsin DNR doing to prevent HABs? Um, mainly our focus is on nutrient reduction efforts because of course, uh, once nutrients like phosphorus get into a lake, um, there, it's very difficult to remove them and to address them. It's one of these cases where uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And I really wanna emphasize it's not just the DNR uh, addressing uh, nutrient reductions. Uh, point source regulation and non-point best management practices uh, uh, take the cooperation of a lot of different entities, including mus municipalities, land and watershed groups, counties and UW Extension, uh, agricultural producers, of course, and state and federal agencies. Uh, but the what is really frustrating for the public is that nutrient reduction efforts really aren't a quick fix, and it takes a long time, in, in some cases, to produce results. So one of the main ways that uh, we, we address nutrient reduction is through total maximum daily load projects. And I just, I'm showing you this map to point out that a lot of Wisconsin is covered by either approved, implemented, or TMDLs that are in development. So uh, this is the Wisconsin River TMDL. Um, what, so this addresses some of the blooms that happen in Castle Rock and Petenwell reservoirs in central Wisconsin. We also have significant uh, bloom impacts in Dunn County in Lakes Tainter and Monoman, uh, which drain this very large red cedar watershed as well. So you can see that we have a lot of assessment leading to total maximum daily load projects in Wisconsin. Um, so, so, Gina, just a couple of minutes here. Okay, almost, almost done. So, um, a lot of a lot of the the questions that I get from homeowners if they are in, encountering blooms is well how do I get rid of it? Um, DNR since uh, the waters of our state are are part of our public trust doctrine, we, we have to be very careful about how uh, bloom control, once blooms are present, are how, how bloom control is, is addressed. Uh, in many cases, if we have significant blooms present, we don't permit chemical treatment just because of that possibility that killed that the killed cells are going to release toxins in one big dose, which could have really adverse effects on both people and uh, wildlife in, in the lake. Um, other, other solutions for control are quite often ineffective or just treat the symptom, the, the, the cyanobacterial bloom, not the cause, the, the nutrient uh, 
impairment. So it's really important to reduce in nutrient input in these systems, but uh, internal loading can be very important too in fueling blooms. So it's important to really target um, the treatments to what's going on in a particular lake. There's not always like a, a one size fits all uh, means of addressing blooms. And one of, the, one of the things that we've run into is that we really need control methods to be supported by peer reviewed science. In many cases, um, these are being presented to lake homeowners sort of as a, a magical fix. Um, there's, there's no peer reviewed science to verify that it actually scales up from small systems or even the laboratory. And one of the big gaps in what we know about many of these treatments are the effects on non-target Target organisms. Um, we can't really allow different methods to be used that will create adverse effects on, on fish or aquatic food chains in Wisconsin. So that's, that's one of the, uh, the big gaps that we have um, as far as knowledge for how to get rid of it. So um, again, I think I have maybe time for one or two questions. Please reach out to me if you have any questions. Uh, check out our um, our webpage for Blue Green Algae, which also has links to the Department of Health Services webpage for cyanobacteria. And again, if you're interested in that ITR, ITRC harmful cyanobacterial bloom document, uh, check out the ITRC's uh, website as well. Thank you. Well, thank you, Gina. I think our time will have to move on, but thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, we will, uh, I noticed in the question and answers, there are speakers, or previous speakers have now answered 47 of the questions. Mm -hmm. We still have 14 open, and Gina, I see you have several, okay. several questions there. So thank you very much for your presentations. I want to thank all three speakers today. Great job. And again, I learned something very useful uh, about HABs in all three of the presentations. So thank you uh, so much for that all of you. We will be stopping. We'll be fit. We're finished with this morning's session. At 11 o'clock, those of you that have signed up for the facilitated discussions, we'll be starting that up at 11. I believe that has a separate link to get into those. And you should have received that link. And then uh, at one o'clock, we will be starting the second session today, the scientific uh, presentations. And that will be on preventing and treating HABs. So uh, I'll see you again. I guess we'll see the speakers again at one o'clock. Those are in the facilitated discussion. It'll start just in a few minutes. So thank you.